Hi, I'm Jeff Arnell, the Executive Director of the Black Mountain College Museum and Art Center here in Asheville, North Carolina. Welcome to today's Perspectives Conversation with artists Steve Locke and Ben Hall. This program is presented as part of our Museum from Home initiative. During the shutdown, we had the opportunity to connect artists, curators, and scholars with our museum community around the world. We are excited to share this event with you free of cost. Thank you to our funders and individuals who have supported our museum during these uncertain times. Your generosity has enabled us to offer these online programs. To keep our museum programs alive, please consider becoming a museum member today. See the link below for more information or visit us at blackmountaincollege.org. As an artist, Steve Locke is known for work that explores themes related to masculinity, race, and class and the consequences of power and violence. Today, Steve and Ben plan to discuss some of Locke's past work, including No One Is Left to Blame, Three Deliberate Graves for Freddie, and the Auction Block Hall proposal. This will lead to his current work, Homage to the Auction Block, a series informed by Joseph Albers' Homage to the Square. Paintings from the series are now on view at the Lamontagne Gallery in Boston. After the talk, please take some time to check out Steve's work at stevelock.com. You can also find Steve and Ben's bios below, along with some more links. A big thank you to Steve and Ben for making time for the conversation today. I'm so pleased that they are able to join us. Please welcome Steve Locke and Ben Hall to today's program. Hi, Ben. Hi, Steve. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to be here in conversation with Steve Locke, who I've been a fan of for some years now. We met in Detroit, and uh, the thing that kind of really was curious to me about Steve's work when I first started out was, uh, I guess, anonymity and disfigurement um, are the two things that come to mind. Um, much of his portraiture work at that time, and I think most of the body of work that I had seen or that I was familiar with, um, was both about, it's about the representation of men, but also about the representation of violence. Um, and I'm going to do my best to uh, stay here between the colloquial and Hal Foster. Um, every time I see mm -hmm. Hal Foster, he always has like 30 pages of notes for a talk, for a one hour talk. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, how do you think that you're gonna get through that? Um, but when I, what I noticed about those paintings, uh, not being particularly attracted to, I guess, contemporary figuration in a way, was the fact that first of all, the heads were floating, um, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, the violence, of the disfigurement or the beheading or the decapitation, whatever the case may be, was separate from what you saw in the picture. You didn't get to see that in the picture. You just got to see the heads. And the heads still seemed very much alive. And there were always a lot of them. So it was this, this ghost and this haunting. Um, and this kind of idea as, and something I had never thought of before, is figuration as vulnerability and the body being altered. Um, again, something I never really considered, but also a lot of these things that I would think of, <laughs> maybe I wouldn't tell someone over coffee because I didn't want them to think that I was like in outer space. Like, you know what else, Steve? <laughs> They're disfigured. People would be like, what are you talking about? Um, as soon as this later body of work came into being, I started to realize, I think that I was right <laughs> all along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that these different kinds of violence against the male body um, that are perpetrated by the state, I mean, especially seeing you wear a Fauci shirt and thinking about him as being, I guess, the number one AIDS researcher in the country. Um, mm -hmm. And now, now he's in the public spotlight for something right. for which 20 years ago he was kind of a different sort of villain. Um, mm -hmm. I just wa wondered if you could talk a little bit about disfiguration I mean, because it's, I never also thought of that until right now, figuration versus disfiguration. Right, right, right. And just violence in general, or how that, how that attached to the earlier work uh, with these disembodied heads. Well, I mean, first of all, I could listen to you talk about my work all day. <laughs> and it's really, I mean, the, the pleasure in doing this is all mine because 
you're absolutely brilliant and generous and so smart. And um, I could I could talk to you for for hours about anything, you know. So, and it's it's wonderful to have someone who is able to look so carefully at something that you've made. I find that in in the contemporary moment, we um, scan things, you know, for information, not even for knowledge. We just sort of scan them, you know. And the act of making a painting is something that happens in time. And so when we're thinking about time, um, the painting isn't just the image. It's all the time that went into making it. So it's every single painting that was, and some of those paintings in, um, in that show, There's No One Left to Blame, some of those paintings I'd painted on for like 10 years. Yeah. And so for me, that sort of idea of making, um, a body became almost impossible because I couldn't think about an intact body anymore. I mean, I lived through the, the AIDS epidemic, the, um, all that sort of work that was happening in the 80s and 90s about uh, the mortification of the body. I grew up Catholic, so like there's a very, that's a religion about the body, right? So I'm steeped in it, you know, as a portrait painter. But how do you, but the history of portraiture, Ben, is the, hit, is the history of some demonstration of power, right? And so like you have a portrait of the king, so you know who the, who the king is. So what does it mean to be a disempowered person or someone who's not considered worthy or someone who's diseased or discardable? Like what kind of portraiture happens for them? Yeah. And you know, the, the notion of making a, um, some, something that's alive and dead at the same time was very much in my, my mindset. Um, it's a very difficult thing to make paintings of the human figure without addressing, uh, the human capacity for cruelty. Right. And that's what a lot of, there was no one left to blame was about. It was about you know putting someone's head on a spike you know and you come from a, a group of people who it's funny like i i remember when fauci um fauci didn't become fauci until larry kramer just started deciding to kick his ass every day you know and so that notion that uh, someone could learn right that someone could learn and change and develop is part of why i i got this shirt and part of why i'm so interested in watching him be vilified now. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, let's say rest in peace, Larry Kramer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the greats. Um, but especially, I think in this particular time, interesting to think about someone who could be so single-minded and sort of, I mean, in the way that I very much, you know, I, people talk about BLM as though it's this thing that's always existed. Um, not thinking that it's a woman and trans led organization right. and that it, it, it didn't exist 10 years ago. It just no. didn't exist. So mm -hmm. the, the single power of that is super important. And I, I, I guess it makes me come back to the thing that you said about portraiture being about power. And yes, of course, I mean, I sometimes forget, I, I don't think about <laughs> portraiture perhaps enough, partially because I think just thinking about Instagram and selfies and everything else, the mm -hmm. kind of uh, obfuscation of what portraiture even exa exists as anymore is starting to change. Mm -hmm. But something that I think that I picked up that I guess it's a kind of twin part is that I would, if I had read that, if I didn't know you and I read that, I would be, I would think, oh, well, that's kind of not exactly true because the portraiture that you were using before did this really interesting trick in that it was super intimate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's a question of scale or a question of the way that the faces blend together one to the next. You can pick any two and they don't really look like each other, but you can kind of, it's almost choose your own adventure between the... Yeah, yeah. It's cruising. Uh, yeah. That's really essentially what it is. You know, that's really, that's really what that is. It's um, that experience of being in um an arena of men and um not having any shame about looking at them so that's where that intimacy comes from right and that's a very important part of it 
But the other part of it is like, you know, all the, you know, I grew up in the Detroit Institute of the Arts and in a museum where like that's that historical canonical idea about portraiture was sort of ground into my head. Like that's part of my legacy, right? And so how do you queer that? How do you make it different? Like we changed the scale. So I'm not making giant heroic paintings of men. I'm making these small paintings of men that you might see through a glory hole or you're seeing a peep show or something like that. And understanding that that's part of the um, culture that was lost in, um, in the AIDS epidemic. That whole, like people don't know how to cruise each other on the street anymore. It's a very strange thing. I, you know, you look at someone like, and they like, like, what are you staring at? Like they're ready to fight with you. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just cruising you. I just, I find you attractive and that's why I'm looking at you. Um, uh, but you know, if someone's like 50 feet from me on an app, then I can understand like attractiveness. And, and this thing you said about Instagram and selfie culture is so interesting because when people start to be able to make their own images of themselves, right? It's not just like you're not hiring me to paint your portrait, right? If you hired me to paint your portrait now, it'd be like a super special thing, right? Like the the um, Kahindi Wiley's painting of Obama or Amy Sherald's painting of Michelle Obama. When was the last time people got excited about portrait? Like you know, like the whole country was excited about that. So it's kind of a bankrupt area, you know, this idea of like painted portraiture, and that's one of the reasons why it, it is so um, so permeable for that kind of queer tendency to just sort of push up against it a little bit. No, that's funny because I remember, I mean, I often, uh, especially because I'm married uh, and because I spent a long time as a single person moving mm -hmm. into his forties, trying to find a partner. Um, and because dating apps worked in such a way that you're supposed to extrapolate this information from a very kind of rarefied uh, amount of information that yeah, I mean, as much as you would extrapolate on the street, you know, it is the same in sort of a way as cruising or trying to pick somebody up and how, how mm -hmm. am I going to, and I can't stand selfies or photos in general of myself. I'm just a little uh, camera averse. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I found is that you can actually telegraph and, and embed frequencies into that thing, maybe in ways that a look can't because a look is existing in time. Mm -hmm. where the photo is fixed. So in that kind of app culture, you can go back and look at that thing over and over. And right. now that I'm married, I find it so interesting because every so often someone will contact me on Instagram or follow me or we'll start talking. And then if that person happens to be a woman and I go to their page and it's a lot of selfies, I'm like, yeah, I can't follow you. Like this yeah. just looks untoward. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks as though I'm a creep in a kind of way where I used to be friends <laughs> with someone. And at one point he was talking about not being able to get a girlfriend. And I, you know, he said that she had mentioned something about his Instagram. And I said, well, you know, you follow a lot of women, man. Like you follow right. a lot of women who you also don't know and don't have mutual friends with. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, but I know something, something. And isn't that what social media is for? And I was like, no, no that's what, no. That's what Google incognito windows for. <laughs> like right. that is not That's a different thing. That's yeah. a completely different thing. Yeah. Especially with the kind of heteronormative behavior of of ingesting images and what constitutes that ingestion of images now, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, but I think that that kind of to go back, I think that it's interesting because the portraiture although it kind of it telegraphs anonymity, it's not anonymous. And right. so when you're talking about cruising culture, I think that that's that's that kind of switch where you go from anonymous moment to intensely, intensely intimate moment. Mm -hmm. And so intimacy kind of, not to say that there's not a power relationship in intimacy, but that you're doing something that I don't think I see very often in terms of how it accesses intimacy in the way that most people I think would shy away from, right? They would, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of... I'm not so sure about that. I think that I think that if people had the opportunity to fall in love, they would fall in love. Like I think that that's hmm. what that is. And I don't like I'm 57 now, and my cruising days are somewhat over. You know what I mean? But um, I 
there was a time when I was younger where I was in love with everybody I had sex with. And it's like Edmund White said, you know, you have your relationship, a whole love affair in 24 hours, have a complete relationship with somebody. And I thought that that was freedom. You know, this is like my pre um, epidemic experience of being gay. Like that was freedom. Like you could love everybody. You could love as many people as you wanted, right? And there wasn't um, a finite amount of love, right? And intimacy could be on a scale, right? You could have your uh, life partner and then you could have um, another kind of lover and then you could have friends. Everything, in it, all the intimacy did not have to reside in one relationship, right? And I think that that kind of, um, that kind of community, you know, like a lot of my friends had been, I'd slept with a lot of my friends growing up, right? Because we had sex and then we're like, well, you know, that was fun, but let's never do that again. So let's just be friends, right? And so that kind of intimacy is, is baked into my experience as a, 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 as a person coming of age, right? And so when I started making paintings, I started, I was thinking very much about that. Like, how do you make a, a painting of someone that is alive in your memory, but is dead, you know? Like, the, there is no one left to blame is full of paintings of dead lovers, you know? And that kind of, um, and the dead are with us all the time. They're with us all the time. Like, you could walk into a room that you've been in with someone who's gone and their presence is still there. So I'm not... Um, I'm not opposed to that idea of intimacy and, um, and temporariness or quickness. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of it. Well, it reminds me of two things. And I know we talked about this, but I, I still really love the title, uh, No One Is Left to Blame, because I love this ideal of kind of the narrowing of time, creating a sovereign effect of having to interface with the whole of things. Uh, without right. that legacy of victimhood, victimization, blame, not to say that those aren't relevant causes, but for the personal person to get through the day. Um, mm -hmm. But it also reminds me of this thing that someone, it was a very, it was a very hard moment, um, but that scale of intimacy that you're talking about, or just... Uh, the way that intimacy can be plugged in, like it can have multiple power sources from the grid, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which I mm -hmm. guess we're getting That's to beautiful. the grid. Really anyway. I'm going to write that down. I'm writing <laughs> down what you just said. That was, um, that was really good. But that I, you know, I had come home from Italy once. I was visiting friends and I came home and the partner that I lived with was like, yeah, I'm out. I'm leaving. And I was like, but we don't get to talk about this at all. Like, mm -hmm. I, we were talking while I was in Italy and everything was fine. And she's like, well, I'm all packed up and I'll be gone tomorrow. And I, I was like, huh. And it hadn't been like a particularly long relationship. And the living together was out of convenience. And she said, you know what your problem is? And I said, what? And she said, you are not codependent enough. And I was like, wow. I, don't, I don't understand that. And she told me that I was, I mean, she was kind of, she was a tech person or is a tech person. And she said that you're like a bit torrent of intimacy that you can just to get your whole, the wholeness of your intimacy and the compound of love, you can call a friend, you can do this, you can do this generous thing for someone. There's so many different ways that you can get that energy in right. total. Um, which I, when you said that, it's interesting because I think that's also something that we talked about, about the kind of bathhouse, being bathhouse adjacent and being around mm -hmm. and growing up and that, that being a kind of different frequency that doesn't necessarily always rate in terms of being, especially when I was younger, I mean, in the nineties, there just weren't a lot of straight, young, mixy boys, uh, who were just a wholesale comfortable with gay men, but right. I could, I men, I wouldn't have been able to be comfortable with cousins, etc. But that thing that you're talking about, I think, also is something about the kind of truest form of intimacy, which is not the intimacy that we seek in others, but the in intimacy that we kind of allow in ourselves, mm -hmm. um, and which kind of goes back to looking, um, yeah. because when you're talking about this act of looking, I think one of the things that especially if I'm with students and they say, well, how do you, 
how do I do this thing? Or I'm trying to, they try to explain all of the things that aren't in the work, mm -hmm. <laughs> which right, is obviously right. a thing. Or, you mm -hmm. know, if you, if you only knew the title and I would say, well, but I'm not really, I'm not totally invested in the looking and you don't mm -hmm. seem totally invested in the looking. So we can't share that space together. Right. And as a consequence, we have to create a third space, which is not quite as generous, is a bit language laden in the kind of worst sense of it. But I think mm -hmm. that that intimacy that you're talking about is a real kind of trick. Um, right. That's beautiful. Well, I mean, <laughs> but you know, this is the thing, uh, Ben, like you, I'm going to dare uh, people to, like, I'm going to dare you to love me, right? I'm going to make myself vulnerable enough and dare you to love me. So if you can't love me, that's on you. That's not on me because I was here. And I got to say that person who told you about the BitTorrent thing, you dodged a bullet. You really did, sweetie. You dodged a bullet on that one. You know, I have to thank all the ancestors for that. <laughs> Very smart person though. Um, uh, <laughs> well, so when you talk about vulnerability, though, it kind of immediately and dare to be loved. I mean, I think it brings up the current moment and the current work or going back to Freddie Gray. Mm -hmm. So I think just as if we could kind of, I mean, we're moving forward, but we're not moving to the most present work to go right. back to the, the Freddie Gray work at uh, the Gardner Museum in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and something that we talked about very early on in the conversation was the idea that F Freddie Gray suffered from, and Ariel, who you know, my wife, uh, is the queen of saying things straight out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a lynching, right? Yeah. It was nothing other than a lynching, much in the same way that it was the Emmett Till lynching because right. he looked at someone wrong, mm -hmm. right? That's someone all he did. That's someone all he in did. a position he looked at of somebody power. the wrong way, right? right. And so could you talk a little bit about what that move is from what we deign as a kind of uh, very focused on the epidemic and gay life and gay black male life to black male life mm. and the current moment? Because one seems to be uh, figurative and a bit, I mean, really dealing with personal intimacy. Mm -hmm. And and the body, of course, but then and you do this switch when you hit Freddie Gray, where it's like it can no longer be as it was because of right. that moment. So I don't know if you could just talk a little bit about what that change was or how it came into being, other than seeing the videos, etc. Well, it's so strange because um, I I still think of myself as someone who works with portraiture. Like, I still think of myself that way, even though the work is starting to move away from images of people. And so, like, that sort of idea, the way that people talk about the body or the Black body has become really interesting to me because that is a formation that is not, it's not based in the religious uh, background of the civil rights era, where we talk about Black spirit and stuff like that. Like, you know, so now we're talking about people's bodies, which is all you have in this world. If, if you're, um, you're suffer and go on to some other uh, reward. So now we're just talking about my body being here and now, right? That's what's important, right? So, and also, you know, Ben, like my other work in portraiture, like people really want to police what black artists do. Like they really want black people to make um, certain kinds of paintings about blackness. Um, like, like they have to be uplifting or they have to be magical or they, they have to be like, um, like documentary or something or, or stuff like that. And I, I think that there's all kinds of black people. Like I grew up in Detroit, so there wasn't like one kind of black person. So I could paint any kind of person I want and, and decide that they were black. You know what I mean? Like and I, for the audience, we both grew up in Detroit. So <laughs> this is one of the things that Steve and I share about the few artists and the few people who are still around in a way. Well, it's a weird thing for both of us because whenever we hear people start to talk, when we, especially when we start to hear black artists talk about what blackness is, or as if there's like a, some sort of unified theory of being black, I always sort of look at people like they're kind of crazy because, you know, there's all kinds of black people. So to, notion, to have this notion that there's one aesthetic or that there's one way of engaging with that subject 
has always seemed kind of nuts to me, right? So getting to Freddie Gray, I, I don't believe that, um, you know, I'm doing all this work in portraiture where I'm, I'm critiquing the notion that a painted image confers dignity on a person, right? I'm sort of blowing up this notion of the, the portrait as this idea of the masculine ideal, right? A picture of the king or picture of the president or whatever, right? So we get to Freddie Gray and we get to murder, state-sponsored murder, right? But Freddie Gray doesn't need me to make him more dignified. Sorry, we had a power outage in New York, but I wanted to just kind of mention two things that, as you had said, one was you were talking about the kind of the end of the arc, and I was reminded of you know something Tanahasi Coates said with your your uh, splitting this kind of like the spiritual from the body, right? Right. Like 60 civil right era. And so much of that comes from this background of the church. And so when Martin Luther King's talking about the arc of justice mm -hmm. bends towards, what is it bend towards? Bends towards justice. Everybody arc on the, the arc of the moral right. universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Right. So right. I'm, you'll have to apologize. I have baby brain. I have a newborn. Um, so everybody can... never apologize for that. Um, I, but I know that quote and it was just it seems <laughs> so out of reach, uh, much like my child when he's reaching for something. Um, but I think what ta Coates says is that, you know, in his household, Malcolm X was Jesus, mm -hmm. right? So they didn't have this kind of a more moral equivalency that came from the church. And what he said about the arc of justice is that if you die, that's the end of your arc. That's it. That's the end of it. So I think related to Freddie Gray, that's the, that's the first thing that I would like to just point out. And the second point is, is that when we're thinking about this divergence back towards the body and mm -hmm. towards even portraiture, when you're saying this thing about it, it's never not portraiture. Right. That's something that I think is, is, I don't want to, you know, I don't want, far be it to me from con to congratulate you for thinking <laughs> thoughtfully and considerately about your work, <laughs> but it's such kind of a no brainer in that way. You're so funny. And that we can consider these things as not as though they're divorced because I think, divorced from the personal right well, and i think like the form and content come together in the body right exactly, right? exactly. You know what i mean and so like that's something and this like this is the the lie that people tell people about modernism is that somehow it was just about content i mean it was just about form like just contemplate this beautiful form it doesn't have any content it's just the form and it's supposed to bring you back to yourself and all this sort of stuff but I just think, you know, I, I look at forms, I, 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 we can't think of things outside of form. We can't think of anything outside of giving it a form. So color and shape have meaning. Like, and in, in trying to erase that is a way to erase the experience of black and brown people. You know, because yeah. we, we are forms and we have content, right? And so that sort of push towards moving towards a more um, direct, appreciation of color and shape without relying on physiognomy. Freddie Gray just created the problem. And so I had to figure out a way to solve it because like I said, there's enough images of black people being murdered. I need to make a 60 foot image of a black man being murdered and put that on the side of a museum. I'm not gonna do that. Um, and by the same token, I'm not gonna make some quasi religious image of the apotheosis of Freddie Gray because he didn't deserve that. He didn't. I'm not going to confer greatness on him by making an image of him. Who the fuck do you think I am? Like, I can't do that to him. He already had dignity and worth and someone stole that from him. That's what lynching is about. It's not about like, oh, this person is a victim. So we have to dignify them. No, they were already dignified. Stop telling black people that they need to be dignified. They're already dignified. Right? So that, that's the problem then. Like, how do I make this image? How do I talk about this extermination of a person without relying on like uh, lynching porn or um, or not addressing it at all or, or pretending it didn't happen. You know, you have this opportunity, the Gardner Museum, which is a wonderful place. It's a museum in Roxbury. 
is doors are open to the kids in that community, right? So I had a, a, an opportunity to make a, something that was facing that community that talked about the, exer the extermination of someone, something that we all knew, right? And so distilling it down to color, like his name gave me that, like just the name Freddie Gray gave me the name to understand what color is that. And like to defy this notion of singularity, maybe there's three different versions of Freddie Gray, you know, and then thinking about time, you know, when he was alive and, and um, most vibrant, and then when he's attacked, and then when he's fighting for his life in the hospital. And it was imperative of me not to use images for that project of him dead. I wanted him to be alive, right? And so the t it becomes this timeline that moves from saturated color down to like almost a silvery whiteness and people would look at it they didn't know what the hell it was it's like oh it looks like different flavors of ice cream i'm like yeah that's great how beautiful is that to think of someone's life as if it was flavors of ice cream that's a beautiful thing you know and then the the sort of the punch that comes when you learn what those colors are and the origin of those colors the gut punch that you feel is part and parcel of what it means to live in that kind of a body. Like, so that's the connection. So the form and the content are completely married in that piece. You know, it was hard won, but it was really, and, and, and it's, a, it's a fulcrum in the work, in my work, because it made me realize that I could do that. I could get the same intimacy and charge with color and shape that I could with physiognomy. That was the thing, right? That that's incredible. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you were able to find that fulcrum. Uh, those moments come few and far between. I mean, I definitely remember my own experience of being in undergrad, quite old, um, but being in undergrad and seeing Adrian Piper's for the first work for the first time and being like, "Oh, shit." there's this whole other world that opens up about the way that we engage language and we engage image mm -hmm. and what the image was. And it, it, they were really those kind of, uh, I don't want to call them bad drawings, but they're those drawings that are quite cartoonish. Um, like what you looking at mofo of the yeah, yeah, yeah. mythic being and, you know, kind of, we're all supposed to pick something out. And I, I wasn't an art. I was, you were allowed to take art classes at Bennington, but I wasn't an art major or whatever. Um, I would try to be, I was confused. Um, <laughs> and you'd come around and everybody would say, well, what's the work that like most spoke to you? And so you had to find it. This was at the Clark or the, no, not at the Clark, the Williams College Museum. Mm -hmm. And then you'd present about it afterwards, something you had seen rather than something you were looking at in the book. And I remembered how confused everybody else was because for them, it was about, and I'm going to make a very broad appraisal <laughs> uh, uh, of the group of students I was working with, but it was very much about consumption, it seemed. Right. Like, you just take these images, you take them however you want. And I was like, yes, but you can actually see the person. It's right. almost as though rather than putting someone at this arm's length, what she did was collapse this space. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting because on one hand, you have this super uh intimate anonymous intimate anonymous kind of cruising subject hood that you use in this earlier figuration and then there's this press out but then there's the gut punch of it's gonna do the work once you read the i mean you say punch and i don't want to say punchline because we're it mitigates the impact of what we're talking about but mm -hmm. of course as soon as you read the title you're like you know you go back there, to there it. it is you know right. you can, you can understand it and that, that delivery system of using language mm -hmm. rather than using the image, the image is in combination with the language right. um, is exactly a fulcrum. Um, so then it, it, it occurs to me that you're, you're also doing this other thing that um, I think when you're talking about Freddie Gray or, or Freddie Gray, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that, it's interesting because we talked about Freddie Gray as a lynching and in response to Emmett Till, right? Mm -hmm. So, which of course, this kind of lynching porn and the way that we see images of black bodies and brown bodies being destroyed on the internet now starts with Mamie Till, right? Who's right. like 
you have to see my child so that we can even understand what it is that we're talking about. And Jet Magazine. Right. Yeah, yes. that choice, yeah. Yeah, huge. Um, and so as the- Newspapers were told that they could not show those photographs. Exactly. And in the Jet same- Magazine showed them. Right, even in the same way that we're in this 20 year war and there's no body bags coming home right. from Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. um, as soon as we take those, it's funny because whenever someone's like, if it bleeds, it leads, talking about the newspaper, I'm like, eh, mm, sometimes, you know, like there's plenty of things that they could write about if they wanted to write about state terror or if they wanted to write about the AIDS epidemic. There's mm -hmm. plenty of people dying every day, but it's like, you know, what is, especially now that it's not just what we think drives viewership on television. We don't know if the people are in front of the television but we know that the clicks are driving how we see what images and what they report on. And then right. we see somebody like the New York times, they definitely <laughs> step away from some humanitarian things that they could clearly write about or choose to report on if they did, which is not to denigrate the many great journalists who are there and what they do, but the well, idea and that it is what it is. And when you realize what, <laughs> when people are thinking about uh, the difference between information and attention, right and the the internet is about attention like what is what what is going to get attention um uh this listicle about uh the top 10 ways that um you're a racist or stuff like that that's what's going to get attention instead of like ta coates writing a book or a long form essay for the atlantic about the case for reparations right and so the and so many people are illiterate about the news like they don't understand the difference between the news news analysis and opinion right so you have all these people on facebook posting opinion pieces saying like oh this news article um uh uh makes a really great point it's like no that's an opinion article the news article is on the next page where they talk about what happened and they don't make any judgments about it right um in this current moment where people think that everyone is biased and everyone is um, on a side and everyone is partisan. And it's like, well, you know, I understand that there are biases, but the goal is to try to be unbiased. It's an unattainable goal, but it's the goal. So instead of reading things and thinking, oh, this is biased, like you read it and you think, is this person trying to be unbiased? Are they transparent about where their bias is? Right. And that's the that's the part that's missing. And that's the why when we hear about stories in the New York Times or stuff like that, what gets engagement? Because engagement isn't about bias. It's just about like, you know, um, it, it's confirming your bias. You know, I'm going to put this uh, clickbait headline on this article and it's going to engage people's biases about, you know, how they feel about the president or how they feel about Nancy Pelosi or whatever. And they're going to click on it. Right. Yes, of course. I mean, confirmation bias is always, um, <laughs> it always works, right? That, that kind of silo, silo it breeding. Is really, it is really the basis of the information economy right, right. now is confirmation well, bias. And so when you're talking about, I mean, you said information versus attention. And then earlier you had said information versus knowledge. Right. And I think when we think about that attention, it also is just about looking like all three mm -hmm. of those things are the way that we're taking in that information is through looking, right. even if it's reading. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about that kind of reckless eyeball and the image, how it's presented, I was also kind of tying that back to the idea of the glance as though mm -hmm. the glance in cruising, but the glance over your shoulder to the police officer. Right. I, you know, there's this, it's funny because I remembered seeing Magnolia when it first came out. The oh, such Paul a glorious Thomas. movie. Yeah. Oh. But the cop, I mean, so there's so much sadness and there's this d incredible melancholia that runs through the film. But also it's very interesting because I had to turn it, I remembered at the time seeing it with someone and kind of getting in an argument about them with them because basically there's only two black characters. There's the one who killed her husband and her son, the worm. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's a third, the child who raps. Right. Right. And so at a certain point he says, he basically accused this child who's maybe 10 or 11 at the time says, uh, I'll show you something. I'll bust. If you show me some trust. Tell me what 
what you know. I'll tell you what I know. No can do. Leave this one to the detective. Think for the soft shit. I can help you. Make you the man with the plan. Give you the gift that I flow. Think fast. You want to know who killed that guy? Okay, you. Come here. No. I'm here. You want to disrespect an officer of the law? I can help you solve the case. I can tell you who did it. Oh, you're a joker, huh? You tell me jokes? I'm a rapper. Oh, you're a rapper. Oh, okay. You got a record contract? Not yet. You the clue for the bus if you show me some trust. Have you ever been to Juvenile Hall? I ain't fucking with you. Hey, watch the mouth. Watch it. Come on, man. Just watch me. Watch and listen. Okay. Presents. With a double ass meaning it's up a stove. With my riff and my front but you don't hit me though. Think fast, kiss me oh, cause I throw what I know with the resonance. For your trouble ass, feeding the wind in yourself off of the back of the shelf. Jack gas, crackers, body stackers, dick two niggas, hey, master hold, pain, hold, your Hold it, homeboy. I don't need to hear that word. Living to get older, with a chip on your shoulder, except you think you got a grip, cause your hip got a holster. Ain't no confessor, so buster, you better just shut the fuck up. Try to listen oh, and learn. Oh, oh, cut it, Julio. I've had enough with the mouth and the language. I'm almost done. Finish it up without the lip. Check that eagle. Come off it. I'm the prophet. The professor. I'ma teach you about the worm. Who eventually turned to catch wreck with the neck of a long time oppressor. And he's running from the devil, but the debt is always gaining. And if he's worth being hurt, he's worth being a pain in. When the sunshine don't work, the good Lord being a rain in. And that shit will, will help you solve the case. And he raps basically that his brother is responsible for killing his stepfather, who's this white man, or his father. Right. It's right. unclear. And he, he tells the cop, and it's, you know, this isn't so far after Rodney King. He says, uh, cracker, body stacker, kill two niggers. And John C. Riley, who's like a young John C. Riley, is like, hold it right there, Coolio. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to hear that talk. And yeah. I think it's that particular division of like, He's offended in this moment so much so that he can't hear. Right. Right. That there's actually an opportunity for him to sol- become the hero that he wants to be inside the movie. Right. And so now, I mean, this is a very Anglophile film in a way, mm-hmm. considering it's LA. Like, it's pretty, like, right. there's not a lot of brown people in that film. Like, there's no, no. Mexicans, there's no, no, there's nothing. Right. And so, it's interesting because now Paul Thomas Anderson is, of course, married to Minnie Ripperton's daughter, mm-hmm. uh, Maya Rudolph, like this ultimate kind of exhibition of blackness and black understanding. And that time is exactly that kind of time that I think the BLM and image making movement, if we think about moving images, mm-hmm. even I don't know when that was, that was probably like the late 90s, Magnolia. Mm-hmm. I have to look it up. It's um, 98 or something but so if that's if that's the case then like what can we expect it 20 years later in the magnolia redux of, of understanding mm-hmm. that like black people experiencing these the same sort of melancholia the same sort of heartbreak um which is the opposite and this is how i'm bringing it all the way back around is the opposite of kind of like saying freddie gray went to jail or Eric Garner was selling loose cigarettes or Michael oh, Brown yeah. might have stolen a candy bar right. or George Floyd. Like I keep trying to read like reluctantly. I just want to know, like, why did you bring up this counterfeit $20 bill? Yeah. Why is that germane? You murdered a man. Why is that germane? Yeah. yeah. Like it doesn't matter. Even if yeah. it does, I mean, principally you would like write a ticket because mm-hmm. even in that same way of assuming this single police officer who's essentially a service worker of the state right um Mm -hmm. is showing up uh has to do you know has to like really work hard to get this job so that they can get a retirement package i mean Mm -hmm. that's essentially why you become a cop so that you can have a decent retirement package that isn't going to get destroyed Mm -hmm. um or you know enron or detroit you know everything's bankrupt so you get 50 percent of what you worked for for 30 years like that's exactly why you become a cop so as a consequence i'm wondering when that agent of the state shows up to look at that counterfeit money how would he know 
right? Like no one's talking about the kind of true absurdity of the moment of four cops showing up for a $20 bill mm -hmm. or a loose cigarette, mm -hmm. right? These are just, these are actually just opportunities right? Um, that are different. And I think that that thing that I'm trying to dig down to is that what you're describing in the work about Freddie Gray, um, that he is just a person and that he has three stages mm -hmm. is also the disavowal of like kind of the America, the state pushing everything down into like one understanding of blackness, which right. another thing you said around that, um, the Freddie Gray part of it and this like single understanding of blackness, I was reminded of uh, X Clan and heed the words of the brother um, in this, or sorry, all hail Funkin' lesson from the 90s. So, um, what Brother Jay says in the first verse is mortals label me as illogical, mythological. So, like those two things, like the idea mm -hmm. that those can be held. Um, right. They couldn't comprehend when I brought the word a stick called verb, a black steel nerve. And then this, this is the punch, <laughs> um, teaching those actors and actresses who write a couple lines on what black is, comma, really, question mark. Then they label me a sin. Right. And it's funny because that particular thing is this kind of compression of one understanding mm -hmm. into a single person. So it also means that each black person is a criminal, each black person is a, like each black person is responsible for all of the stereotypes that right. blackness all, can be. And all the stereotypes are, are points of consumption of blackness. Like every America loves everything about black culture, except actual black people and it has ever been thus. So if a black person decides to be something other than a commodity or an object or, um, uh, an orifice or something if they decide like maybe they want to be a lawyer or a banker or they want to open a bakery like if they want to do any of those other things it's so out of the realm of possibility for people because they've consumed this notion of this one kind of criminal hypersexualized super dangerous blackness right if i were as dangerous as white people think i am I would be fucking Lex Luthor or something. You know what I mean? I'd like I'd be running the planet, you know. But there's this notion, and there's some the appeal of um, black criminality, the sexual sexual sexualization of of, of black movement and black bodies uh, in joy or uh, in any sort of emotional state, right? The way white people use memes of black people reacting to things because they have no access to their own interior life, that they have to reach out and grab something black to represent their own feelings, right? And that's, that's, the, that's the booby prize of racism. That's the problem, like Toni Morrison says, like, like, what if I take that away, from, take your whiteness away from you and what are you? You're all strung out and there you are with your little bitty self, that's it, right? And so when, when black people have this, um, this human response to the world, it is sort of misunderstood by the dominant culture because they really don't see black people as human. Like, why would a black person like Magnolia? There's no black people in that movie. Like, I like it because I'm human. It's a movie about human beings. Like, you're telling me that because I'm black, I can't understand what it's like to be Julianne Moore in this movie. And that is the kind of bias that is detrimental to art, right? And it goes back to this essentialist idea that uh, only black people can make black art and only gay people can make gay art. As if we can, there's no way you could ever understand what it's like to be me. I fucking told you what it was like to be me. Well, and James that's- Baldwin, Go ahead. No, no, I think, sorry. I mean, I wanna hear the Baldwin quote, but I also well, think it's that- I wrote a whole book about what it meant to be white. Like yeah. another country is a book about white people in a black world. Yeah. Huh? Um, but I think it's just this denial of complexity that ultimately is this compression organization. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because as I'm looking at the Zoom screen, the kind of uh, 
next few lines of that song are sneaking out. Um, <laughs> so who write a couple lines about what black is really, then they label me a sin. When a brother just speaks what's within, I guess I'm blacker than the shadow in the darkest alley that they're always scared to go in. Boo. Right. Right. And like that, that if, if you, if you really let, if, if the thing about vulnerability is like when I let white people into my life, right. They, the, 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 the kind of shock they experience at the normalness of my existence is infuriating. It is absolutely infuriating. And that's why I, I try to limit my contact with people because I don't really want to be the person to inform you that I'm just like you. The, the people have internalized the, um, their racism so deeply that they really do believe that there's something special or different or magical about black people. Like there's no magic protecting black people. Black girl magic didn't protect Breonna Taylor. Obviously. You know what I mean? So that's all, that's all, that's just as dehumanizing as anything. You know, like if we just start to embrace black people as people, that would be the most radical thing. And this notion that somehow they're outside of the American family or that they're different than everybody, it's, it's crazy to me. And Ben, it's always been crazy to me because I grew up in Detroit. It was always crazy to me that, that white people hated black people for being black. I always looked at those people like they were nuts. You know, like I'm not like wounded or hurt by their, their hatred. I just looked at them like, oh my God, what, what, what must it be like to be that crazy? Right. That's also, I think, a thing that's particular to Detroit and some other places, certainly, but because of the way that Detroit set up and because it had former wealth, there's mm-hmm. something about former wealth, I think, that really plays into this. Because obviously Detroit has had some tough times in the last 30 years. But, you know, if you go to a vintage store in Detroit, there's all this fabulous shit from the 60s and 70s because kind of, I mean, hyperbolically, everybody had a good job. Right. Um, everybody was on, the, all the men were on the line. They right. Got the UAW, so black men could get jobs yep. in the plants. And that, that was like, that was the heyday of my family. Exactly. Honey, we but, had a gas barbecue grill in the backyard, and that shit was built in. So right. that, like, get, like, girl, girl, <laughs> a height of fabulousness. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it also reminds me, and there, there's a Paul Beatty poem in Joker, Joker Deuce, where he says, you know, all I wanted was a nine to five. Uh, I didn't know I'd have to socialize. Right. And I think that that framework of being trotted out as an exemplar uh, mm-hmm. Each time, I mean, Amanda Seals also talks about that at some point about being, you know, these are all black women who grew up with all white girls, like you're right. black, but you're not black, black. Mm-hmm. And I think one consequence of that is when you're talking about this kind of, if you look at all of the forms that white America has to offer white America, essentially. Right. Um, I had this crew when I owned a restaurant, I had this crew of young black men that worked for me that were all had all went to kind of like a shitty tech school where they lost a lot of money, you know, learn to work in the video game industry. And then it's like, you owe $46,000. Thank you very much. Um, And one of them still works for me, sweetest human in the world. And so when I would do a lot of these junkets and work on labor things and work in activist organizations, and I would be on a board, they would, there would still be this kind of, like tokenism is one thing, diversity mm-hmm. hires another thing, but then there's instrumentalization, right? right. That we're going to, we don't necessarily need a token. It's just the idea that we have to in- instrumentalize that token to look a certain way. Right. And the consequence of that was, is very often I would have to push back and say, well, you know, I'm not fighting for liberation. And they would say, yeah, but I thought you, <laughs> did yeah. you just say something about Huey Newton and Che Guevara? Right. <laughs> I'm getting confused. And I would say, well, that's, I don't know if that's liberation. What I'm fighting for ultimately is the ability of those guys who work for me to like be able to drink grape soda and eat cheese pizza at 27 and play video games and smoke weed, just like their white counterparts exactly. who don't have to, who 
I would get concerned, you know, when I would get a call late at night or even at 930, I would be like, oh, fuck, why are one of these people calling me? Something must be wrong. Right. They must be in jail. Mm -hmm. I have to bail them out. You know, I have to. And God, you know, we would have to bail so many people out because they would get stopped on some bullshit that nobody else would get stopped on. And then, of course, some of the white staff would say, well, I don't get pulled over. I had not you know, and I'd say, well, do you have car insurance? No, exactly. Right, exactly. You know, you're not getting that thing. So I think in terms of the, the way that it evidences, evidences itself in the world, there's not really an acknowledgement that for each, if we're thinking about this in kind of a matrix way of a simulation, for each version of white America, there should be the openness to have that version of black America too, that each one could fit in. And those slots are predetermined by white America. But also there's going to be all of these other black slots that don't yet exist to white America. Right, exactly. Which is the real that trick ever, of it all. Have ever been present, yeah. but then all of a sudden will become like, uh, I saw this thing about uh, this black girl who does Irish step dancing, right? Like, yeah, of course there's black people who do Irish step dancing. There's black people who do all sorts of stuff. Like, it doesn't seem like weird to me. But people are like, oh my God, this black girl does Irish step dancing. Isn't that strange? I'm like, no, it's not strange at all. Why would that be strange? And I, I, I sort of get the level of um, exoticism that people need in their lives because their lives are so fucking empty, right? I get it. But like, don't be looking to me for that shit because that shit is t it's dehumanizing. It's tiring. I'm not going to be like magic for you. I'm not going to do that shit. I'm not going to well, be sort of intriguing. Oh, Steve went to school. Steve was trained by Jesuits. Isn't that interesting? I went to school with a whole bunch of black kids who were trained by Jesuits. Like, what is wrong with you? Right. right? And that level, then that kind of stuff, this is why I say to people all the time, I don't have any white friends because my friends don't act like they're better than me. And whiteness is about superiority. So the minute people start acting like they're better than me or that I'm some sort of like exotic freak or something, I'm just like, honey, I, I, I have no time for you. I have no time. And well, that part, do, sorry, sorry, no, I, I, I didn't, I don't want to do the like open wraparound, but I mean, as you're saying this, I'm looking at the, one of the auction block paintings in the background on the bookshelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, there. That one. You could talk about it. <laughs> yeah. It's across your mind. <laughs> no, because you, I mean, it's interesting that you're talking about this thing. I mean, if, if we use the kind of phrase, the exemplar and think about the exemplar, I mean, you're talking about each black person in turn being put on a box, a pedestal, if you will, right. um, to be consumed. Mm -hmm. Examined, probed. Right. And um, that's... Investigated. All that stuff. I would think in the past, perhaps, I mean, it's interesting because in this moment, things are <laughs> so different for the first time ever. You can have conversations that for years, I w or I mean, I've definitely in the last three months had people call and be like, yeah, I guess, I guess other people also feel the way that you do, right? right? Because also, I mean, I'm, you know, I have white family and white friends and they also are like, yes whiteness and i'm like baby <laughs> i can't i can't i can't be both in a way right i mean yeah. it's the version of the one drop rule but mm -hmm. also not wanting to act as exemplar and right. so it reminds so two things one is that going back to the you know paul Beatty not having a 95 not wanting to socialize also i mean something that you're really bringing to mind is this collective new red order talks about the role of the informant Mm -hmm. um, in the anthropological sense, uh, in that you're supposed to be, when historically, when an anthro anthropologist went to a community, they had to find someone, a person who was going to be a bottleneck to deliver the information of the community. And of course, they'd observe the community as a whole, mm -hmm. but then you'd have this single informant kind of framing how that person was going to be the interlocutor for the interlocutor, right? And then they're going to take this information back. And I'm thinking very much about that, that idea of this kind of not just the compression of a single identity, 
but also the responsibility of the informant for each individual black person mm -hmm. responding to all white worlds. And I mean, I, as I talk about this, Ariel, my wife, um, as of course, you know, like worked in fashion for a long time. And mm -hmm. so her response was very much like, who do I have to be as the only brown or black person in the room 90, 95% of the time? Right. Right. And so that even if a new black worker came in or if she was the new black worker coming into an, an office that only had one black worker, they had to have a certain kind of separation lest they be seen as a group. As the same person. <laughs> right. Not and group, and as and as like an insurgency or something. Right. right. right? Um, and in, as a reflection of each other. So as we're thinking about that, of course, I can't help but think of both the auction block memorial. And, you know, of course, talk about that as much as you want. If people don't know, uh, Steve had forwarded, this is my understanding of it. Steve had forwarded one of the best and most beautiful and thoughtful and heartbreaking pieces um, that I had ever seen, which was basically a in-ground, at-ground level, at-scale uh, platform that was heated to the temperature of a body where we think i Steve, you can qualify this as yeah. need be where we think that the um, slave auction block in Faneuil Hall in Boston, this wild tourist site um, that I went to when I was a child. Uh, that thing is something that people could walk over. They didn't have to be interacted with it. It's they're not confronted with it. It's mm -hmm. just something that they pass over much in the way that they pass over a lot of these memorials throughout the country where lynchings, pogroms, uh, all of the sort of violence that happens in the world uh, happens and we walk right over it. Walk right past it. Yeah, you don't have yeah. to acknowledge it. You don't need one of those like $3,000 memorial signs that says, here lies, here this thing happened. It's just mm. a thing that happened here. Maybe you're going to get a teddy bear in a reef that's kind mm. of degrading in the weather. Um, and so then that work ends up being these kind of, uh, interrogations of the Albert work, um, where we're seeing these same kind of understandings of the blocks breaking down and right. how do we understand form, right? Because right. that's the kind of principal thing that he did was through hundreds of these interrogations that he's doing through color, he's saying, what do we see? Right. And how do we look? Right. And what are these things? It looks like this to this person. There's a bit of a Rorschach real thing, the plan view, as I'm looking at this. Right. Now, um, it's no longer, it is a Rorschach. It is, I guess it is a different kind of Rorschach. Well, you know, it makes me a little hot in the face. What's the, it's the idea of the, um, the screen, like the stain on the screen that makes you see the whole picture, right? This Lacanian idea that we're looking through the screen uh, this imaginary screen that presents the world to us, but then there's a little stain on the on the screen that is reality, and it's like the the thing that like oh you know so and so is so wonderful, but in your in the back of your mind, you know that they're a racist, but the the screen is that everything is great, but the stain is that racism, right? And so like when you look at the Albers, how how did we get here? How did we get to high modernism? What was the road we took, right? And this is the thing, Ben. Black people in America bought and paid for this entire country with their bodies and their lives. Mm -hmm. Everything in this country is because of us. Everything, you know? And so, and that's not an exaggeration, like because of the, the nature of uh, free labor and cotton and all that, and sugar and all that sort of stuff built the modern world. That labor built the modern world. So everything in the motherfucking modern world belongs to me, right? So you can't tell me that uh, Albers and that work is outside of the black experience because the black experience made that work possible, right? So people say like, I'm critiquing Albers or I'm, um, I'm showing that Albers was a racist. I'm like, no baby, I'm putting me and mine in the middle of that. I'm claiming that space that I'm articulating my claim to that space, right? Because that's not white art. That's not European art. That's American art. 
And I, I'm just as American as anybody else. And so, and it was the same thing with the Faneuil Hall project. But Ben, like the, the, the most difficult thing it is to be black is to know the truth and speak it. Because if you're black and you are quiet, people will, will be very happy with that. They enjoy that. And maybe do something kind of black, kind of blackish, you know, that kind of gives them a little uh, titillation, right? You know, like maybe like make some imaginary paintings of black people. Well, and if I could just interrupt for a second while I'm thinking of it, because I'll lose it. I'm trying to keep notes and trying to make sure that I have everything. You're very busy. <laughs> well, just I want to make sure that the fullness of the ideas are also present. And I think one thing that we talked about in the previous conversation is a that we have to remember is that Albers himself is a refugee, right? right. So he's coming here as a refugee. Uh, secondarily, uh, Alma Stone Williams uh, was the first student, black student at Black Mountain, and Black Mountain was the first openly integrated college right. in the South. Right. So there's a history there. And then thirdly, that when and I can't remember the name, um, hopefully Black Mountain will post the name of the benefactor of Black Mountain at the time, who is kind of a social scientist uh, who brought Jacob Lawrence there. And Jacob Lawrence, of course, you know, has to get to Black Mountain and talks to Albers. And Albers says, you know, there are no fences here. There's no wall like we're here and the KKK is right over there. Right. So if they come here. There's not much we can do in the form of protection, you know? So, I mean, I think in also in that contemporary moment, we have to really think about like what forms to go back to your early thing about like whiteness and white friends, non-white friends, friends who happen to be white mm -hmm. um, as Amanda Seals would say it. Um, the thing that really kind of rocks me there is that, you know, that's what form does allied ship take in this moment mm -hmm. when you are giving up power? Right, because when Albers agrees to do that, he's not only like living, reliving his own refugee on the runness and mm -hmm. losing the ability to be cited and be placed and be comfortable, mm -hmm. but he's also saying this is more important than my body. Right, because I know that my body is now under <laughs> possible duress by virtue of just its adjacency to a black human. And right, deciding to to be on um, deciding to disavow white supremacy. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, the white race is a club. It's a club you can come in and out of if you're white. Like even if you are, if you decide not to be white for a while and you, then you change your mind and decide to come back, they'll let you back in, right? To willfully disavow yourself from that club is to risk your life. Like we both know, like we both grew up learning about Viola Leozo. Like she risked, she gave up her whiteness and it cost her her life. And so there have been uh, people who are, who are ostensibly white, who disavow white supremacy throughout all, throughout all of American history. A lot of them are dead because of it, right? So like this notion that it's like somehow um, a mystery as to what to do, it, it's always been insulting to me. Like Joseph Albers figured it out. Viola Leozo figured it out. James Reed figured it out. Goodman and uh, uh, Schwerner figured it out, and you're sitting here in 2020 and you can't figure it out? Baby, I have no time. I have no time for you, you know? So the, um, the, 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 the reasoning behind um, putting oneself in that position, if you give up white supremacy, you get to be human. That's it. If you give it up, you get to be human. If you hold on to it, you get to be white with all the sort of stuff that goes along with that. But you lose your humanity, right? So when I was looking at the auction block, I thought about that in Boston as the site, the auction block itself is the site where people decided to turn people into objects, right? It's a transformative site, right? And um, Peter Faneuil in Boston, uh, he made his fortune in trading people. He was a trader. You know, what, do, what do people trade in the 17th century? <laughs> you know, let's talk about it, right? So I wanted to make a marker that acknowledged the fact that the wealth of this building behind us, Faneuil Hall, comes from the trafficking of these people, right? And, you know, Faneuil Hall, it's like it's a marketplace. There's, um, there's shops. There's souvenirs. There's, it's a carnival. But it's also the site 
where merchants were making decisions about the trafficking of black life. And there's no marker anywhere that talks about that. And I found that to be a problem, right? So I proposed an object. Um, I went through the entire process with the city. I got the entire city of Boston, the apparatus of city government to agree with me. The mayor, the, the, the sewer department, the people who own Faneuil Hall. I went through the entire apparatus of government and I had to do that just so I could get to have a public hearing about the object. Right, and if I may, for yeah. the viewers, uh, Steve's website is has a ton of information about the process and what happened, like in the very minute details in terms of what it means to create a thing at grade, what it makes means to make sure that the thing drains. It's a very fascinating read uh, to think oh, about God. what it takes to get something that's all ultimately not that big just to be put in a public space. Right. So I just wanted to say it's a tremendous amount of work. It's so sweet. And then, you know, what we we're talking about, these sort of gatekeepers or these people who, or these interlocutors, like who've decided what is acceptable, right? Before the public hearing, the Boston branch of the NAACP said publicly that they were going to oppose the project, right? And so like the, the all, all sorts of accusations about me came out from people I don't know, which I'm not really interested in rehashing or talking about. It's very painful, it's a very difficult thing. But what I will say, Ben, is that it made me realize that like, you know, there's a lot of trauma that some black people have about being black that I, 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 I just don't have because I grew up in Detroit. Like I never thought there was anything wrong with being black. I thought it was great. That was the best thing in the, in the world, right, you know? And so I don't have, um, I don't look at objects and feel a sense of shame about my blackness because I know my blackness doesn't reside in objects and it doesn't reside in what people think of me. It doesn't reside in any of that stuff, you know? I'm able to look at a statue and see a statue and not see that as like my destiny. Like I, because I know from growing up in a black city that my destiny was my own, right? So the difference is, and living in Boston for almost 30 years, you know, being told that you're not part of the community by black people, that's a painful thing. I still haven't quite gotten over that one. That one really hurt, right? So I, um, I told them, look, you people have whatever discussion you need to have. Like you're saying that my work is getting in the way of a larger discussion about race in Boston. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dip out and y'all can have your conversation, right? So now I'm no longer any sort of barrier to you having the conversation that you think you need to have, right? And they still haven't had a, any sort of conversation. So make of that what you will, right? But that notion of um, truth telling and injecting the reality of blackness into established space is at the heart of that proposal. And between that and Freddie Gray, it sort of pushed me towards the auction block paintings. Like those two things conspired to push me into the, that direction. Right, and again, for the viewers, when you, if you look at this part of, of the auction block proposal, as soon as you see the, I mean, I've seen the auction block drawings before, I've seen what they looked like, and as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh my God, it's like right there. That's as clear as the nose on your face. Um, so that particular thing, as we're looking in the background, and I'm sure uh, Black Mountain will be kind enough to give us some other images of the paintings as we're going on, uh, this understanding that it is really just geometry, right? It's just yeah. geometry, mm -hmm. geometry, it's just a plinth, it's just a dais. Mm -hmm. um, it's all of the things that we think about uh, as we're presenting objects. Right. Well, if or I thought as we're presenting language or that's like where the language gets taken away all that stuff then like when you think about the middle passage right and you think someone sat down and measured how many people they could fit into the hold of a ship right just think about that someone did that math right and that kind of thing is incredibly interesting to me like who decided that people could live during a three-month passage with 14 inches of space. Someone made that decision. Right. right? And so that, that's, about, that's about form. 
that's putting a form over a body, right? And so that that is how the modern world was built, like making these forms to contain, restrict, present, identify black people. And if I, if you start to look at modernism, you can see those forms. You can't not see them. I think that seems like a very perfect place to end. Oh, um, I want to keep talking to you though. <laughs> we can just keep talking. Um, is, the baby, is the baby awake? Uh, let me see. I'll be right back with that baby. <laughs> I just wanted to see the baby. That's the only reason I did this talk is so I could get to see Malcolm. I have an angel, a little sleepy angel. Hey, pumpkin. Oh. The viewers can see this too, Jeff and Kate. You can, oh you can my God. leave the sleepy little beautiful boy. Oh my God, he's so precious. This is Malcolm Juni Laws, everybody. Mm. He's a sleepy little bear. He had a appointment today, so. Oh, he's so uh, perfect. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, we gotta keep we gotta keep some black bodies on the planet. Well, you know, I have to say, um, you have a really cute baby. <laughs> and, um, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to say they're cute, but you got a really cute baby. Yeah. yeah. Mm. More than that, he's sweet. He's got a sweet disposition. He's so quiet and mellow and kind of looks and trips out on things. Well, um, you think about who his parents are. He's a very lucky baby. Uh, he's a very lucky baby to have that much love. Well, Arielle is kind um, in that we, I think I might've mentioned this, but she, we took a class very early on this hypnobirthing class. Mm -hmm. And so she was like meditating one to three hours a day for like six or seven months. God bless her. So the baby is just vibed out. He's just oh, like, right. yeah, I know how to do this life. But mm -hmm. I think in closing, if we haven't closed it already, what I would like to say that, you know, these are all about, you know, these black bodies start out as black children. Right. Um, they just start out as infants. They're innocents. They have no uh, guide uh, in this world. Do you hear these little coos? Mm -hmm. There's little... <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think that that's, that's where the work that's happening now, I think in the art world, where we're moving towards something that I think five years ago even was seen as didactic. You would yeah. get the knock of, uh, that's, you're being a bit didactic. Mm -hmm. uh, or this is sloganeering. Um, or it's, it's like, identity-based. No, I'm sorry? It's identity-based. Yeah, or identity-based. I mean, I think the thing is, is that, you know, when we talk about this repair or healing of America, which of course, you know, is going to require a lot of black labor by virtue of the way that things have worked historically. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of like black led moments of trying to find space uh, so that people can understand what equity really is. This work has to be done across all facets, unfortunately. Yeah. Because it hasn't been written and rewritten and inscribed into the histories enough for everyone to know, oh, these are actual histories. This isn't somebody's opinion. Right. There are thousands of people who agree that this thing has happened mm -hmm. in the same way that now it's, I mean, my experience of it, having grown up in primarily a white family with a black dad, is that white folks saw it as some sort of mass hypnosis. Mm -hmm. They're just like all these black people are having the same experiences as though it's like close Nothing. encounters of the third kind or something. Oh, they're all um, exaggerating. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that for me is very troubling, but it's also, I think this, this is the only time that I've seen certain things happen or certain conversations happen in my life that people aren't well, automatically just being like, no, that doesn't exist. Or I don't agree. Or I haven't had that experience from my subject position. So as a consequence, it doesn't exist. Um, we're actually allowing some of these things into existence and we're remembering some of these names. I mean, Viola Liozzo uh, is a big one, obviously, for us because we're from Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, somebody I think about a lot, definitely uh, along the lines of Eyes on the Prize. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I just feel like it's very of that moment where we remember that there are all these people whose names have been forgotten mm -hmm. and whose names haven't been canonized. Right. right, She shouldn't be canonized because she's a white person who she gave her life, but we should remember her. We shouldn't actively forget her. Like and she's also, someone. I mean, 
Well, let me know one better, Ben. When white people think about themselves, why don't they, why don't, why isn't she their hero? Exactly. You know what I mean? Like you don't need, Martin Luther King doesn't have to be your hero. I don't care. How come, how come Viola Diozo is not your hero? Right. Uh, yeah. And that is the thing to me, like, that's what I mean. Like they're so separated from their own experience. They think that they think that slavery is something that was done to black people. Right. Like, no, honey, you, someone did it. <laughs> you understand? Like, it, and that was one of the other things about, you know, the auction block in Boston. People were like, well, this is, we have to consult with black people about this. And I'm like, first of all, I'm black. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and second of all, do you really think that black, that slavery was about black people? Because right. last I checked, white people did it. So right. this is about them. This isn't about you. Like, and so like the, that lack of understanding, that lack of empathy. And, well, that, and truly being able to put yourself into someone's, someone else's shoes. I mean, I think that's the thing about uh, Scheherazade in the 1001 right. Arabian Nights, right? I mean, for people who don't know, essentially the king uh, is cuckolded by the queen. He kills the queen and then goes on a three-year thing where he has a different version every night. Mm -hmm. um, his main, his, his Steve Bannon, if you will, has three daughters. <laughs> I know you'd love that one. Um, has three daughters and he says, your highness, we're all a lot of virgins. And he says, uh, no, there's still three left, your daughters. Yeah. And so he goes back to try to secret his daughters out of the kingdom. And the oldest daughter says, Shahrazad says, no, I got this. Mm -hmm. And so she tells the king a story. At the end of the night, the king says, well, what's the end of the story? This is a cliffhanger. And she says, well, I can't tell you till tomorrow. And he says, but I'm definitely going to kill you tomorrow. I'm definitely going to rape and kill you tomorrow. <laughs> right? And this goes on for a thousand and one nights. And then at the end of those thousand and one nights, the king says, oh, shit, your father must be so worried that you've been gone these three years. <laughs> but finally, he gets it into his head that, you know, there is this other source of being. And I think that inversion, and perhaps we can end it here, I think this is something that I think a, a lot with kind of white allies, people that I come into contact with, I very much remind them. I say, you know, you have to remember that Bob Marley is half white. Mm hmm Gil Scott Heron is half white. Like there are, and there are dozens of these people out there, but these are people who are true freedom fighters, but who also understand that there are these other parts of the world. They're not, they're not a little bit white. They're not white because of like, like long ago rapes that we can't understand. This is like the generation directly before them was white. And then there's also white absence and the lack of white power and the lack of white responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that thing that you're talking about is something that's lost. I don't, you know, it's funny because it's like, you know, we talk about these white people. Um, um, but I, I always think, think about this in terms of like most of my family being right. white, right? You know, and pr particularly with my dad, like very much avoiding or wanting the very fluidity of the kind of look that he had of not having to always be black. Right. right? Like if I'm always black, I'm going to not get as much out of this capitalist world right. You're just not have You're the kind of fluidity. You're so just have a harder time of it. Which yeah. kind of brings us back to poor, poor Freddie Gray yeah. and not being able to circulate through the world and even look at people. Mm -hmm. um, so you and I will talk more soon. I uh, hope so. Separately. Um, get that real for me, will you? I will. She's, she's asleep. We had a long night with kiddo. Okay. I'll All right. talk to you soon. Love you lots. Uh, thanks to Black Mountain for hosting us. We appreciate you all. Thanks to the culture. <laughs>